Mr. Arbery walked into the neighborhood. Didn't run. He then stood in the yard and put his hands on his hips, looked around like this, and then went into the residence. Matt Albenzi was doing work in his yard and he saw this gentleman who resembled the gentleman who had committed what they thought was a burglary in that residence. He shut down the work that he was doing, put a gun in his pocket, grabbed his cell phone, and he walked all the way up to the street to the corner where Jones meets Satilla, where he keeps his mailbox. And he stood there right next to this tree, and he called 911. At some point in the video, when you see Mr. Arbery run out, you'll see he passes right through the window. And Mr. Albenzi is standing right there on the phone calling the police. His behavior then changes. Instantly, Mr. Arbery is at a full sprint, running into the neighborhood. Running into the neighborhood the state is going to infer means he's going on his regular job. But no, because running out of the neighborhood is a problem. It's a problem now because there's a guy standing there on the phone looking at you back in the same residence that you've been caught in now three times. Caught meaning on camera and police coming and searching with lights and Travis McMichael and to return to that house in the middle of the day, like that, after being run off, imagine going to visit a house under normal circumstances. Oh, this house looks like one we might want to buy. I'm going to go in there. Then somebody comes up to you with headlights and tries to stop you from going into the house and confronts you about it. Are you literally ever going to go back to that house again? It is unreasonable to think that he's going back there for some lawful purpose after being run out of there three times before. So he doesn't run out of either of the entrances to go back across the street where he lives. He runs deep into the neighborhood. Someone has called the police. Now, Travis has told you, nothing has erased from his mind about this individual in the two weeks between February 11th and February 23rd. It's all still there. And while he's sitting in his home, his dad comes running in the house and says, the guy who's been breaking in down the street is back. He's running past. Get your gun. Travis and his dad carry their firearms for protection wherever they go. That's what they do. Law allows them to do it. They have permits to do it. Travis testified he had a concealed permit at one point. The law allows this behavior. Travis comes out to the street. He looks down the street, right across. Here he is at 2.30. He comes out here. Mr. Arbery has already run past. He comes out here. He looks down the street from where the house is and sees Mr. Matt Albenzi, who is walking towards him. And eventually, after a couple houses, goes like this and points down the street. It is reasonable to conclude that based on what his dad said, who just came running in the house, the guy's back who's broken in, to come outside and look and see and see Mr. Albenzi, who he knows, who he's talked with, who he's shared thoughts and feelings about the person breaking in the house, is now saying, go that way, the guy is back to get in his car and go. You cannot act on the unsupported statements of others. The state has characterized that, which is an accurate statement of the law, as Travis's mom. Are you kidding? After all that we have seen, after all that he has experienced, after all the conversation that he's had, after all the videos that he's seen, after what he him experienced himself, that, it, that he's just going off of what his mommy told him?
this is what this is what the state wants you to do something about. This is what they're trying to inject into this case, knowing, despite that, that Travis has called the police on the white man under the bridge, knowing that Travis called the police on a carjacker or told his police friends when he was in the Coast Guard and a report was made about the white guy that tried to rob his truck, knowing that Travis called the police about his gun being stolen and readily admits, I don't know who stole it. Knowing that Travis called the police on the 11th of February. They want to try to reduce this case down to this statement, which is not true. Travis had all of this. His reading Facebook, everything going on at Larry English's house, knowing about what was happening in Satilla Shores, speaking with everybody on the 11th, his own experience, Albenzi signaling, Officer Rash and Matt Albenzi, this is what he carried with him when he left his driveway that day. <clears throat> reasonable and probable grounds of suspicion. Reasonable and probable grounds of suspicion. Facts and circumstances to warn a prudent person, one taking care to understand the truth. In believing that the suspect has committed the offense of burglary. Travis believes he's committed the offense of burglary. The facts necessary to establish probable cause for arrest are less than those required to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. more than suspicion or possibility. It's got to be a probability, probably. And he said, I had a probability. There was a probability that this was the guy who did it. And here's why I think he did it. And I wrote down every one of the things that we talked about as he testified. I wrote them all down. And they are all encapsulated in that slide I just told you. This is where the duty and responsibility in following the law becomes intertwined with heartache and tragedy. Because you do have the right to perform a citizen's arrest. You do have the right to have a firearm when you make an arrest. You do have the right to stop a person and to hold them and detain them for the police. And there is risk with that. And there are tragic consequences that can come from that. And we can all sit here right now and say what the state has said from the very beginning and what Travis himself recognizes. If he had only stayed home that day, if he had just sat on the couch and fallen asleep with his kid that day, Travis told you it's not a day that doesn't go by that he doesn't think that exact same thing. But the law allows the citizens to make a citizen's arrest. And if doing so properly, it is the reason for the actions that follow. Here, you talk about an offense being committed in his presence or in his immediate knowledge. What could be more immediate than February 11th? What could be more immediate than seeing the videos of him in the house and talking with police officers and other people including hearing from Larry English through others, that he actually had stuff stolen from his property. An offense has been committed, and he knows about it. He's, he's seen everything other than the hand on the equipment that was stolen. If it's a felony and the offender is escaping or attempting to escape, then you can arrest him upon reasonable and probable grounds of suspicion, probable cause. Travis said many, many times it was the totality of the circumstances. That's his Coast Guard brain. <clears throat> That's his Coast Guard brain saying everything that I knew gave me the belief that a crime had been committed. Escape. Private citizen's warrant arrest must occur immediately after the perpetration of the offense or in the case of felonies during escape. Not every person is arrested at the moment they commit a crime. 
Not every person is arrested by police, because sometimes the police don't get there in time. But if they learn about the person and they have information about the person, escape can happen anytime. Escape can happen later. It doesn't have to happen right at the same time the crime is committed. There's no law that says that. There's no time limit imposed. The police would never be able to arrest anybody. And a citizen is in the same shoes as an officer when it comes to citizen's arrest. So, Travis, leaving his house, decides he's going to follow. That's what he does. He pulls out after his dad crammed into the front seat with the kid's seat there, and he follows. And he watches. And he pulls up next to this gentleman. No gun is raised. No violence is ensued. He doesn't get out of the car. He doesn't tackle him. He doesn't do anything. He does what a reasonably prudent person would do. He does what his training has taught him to do, to use leaps. And he says, hey, man, what's going on? Can you stop for a second, please? I just want to talk to you for a second. There is no violence. If Travis wanted violence against this man, if Travis wanted to hurt him or commit an aggravated assault or commit a false imprisonment, he could have done it right then and there. He doesn't. He talks to him. Mr. Arby looks him in the eye, doesn't say a word, doesn't have to, but that's information for Travis. Is it so offensive to pull up next to somebody and say, hey man, can you stop for a second, I wanna to talk to you? 